primarily we're going to discuss uh, the most requested procedure to go over was pacemakers, so we'll do that, and then we'll discuss some airway stuff, and uh, hopefully the timing will be even less than allotted. So um, there wasn't many pacemakers placed uh, when, when I first got here. The cardiology was doing a predominance of them. I think that's sad. This is definitely a procedure where uh, when it has to be done emergently, we are much more uh, cognitively suited to get it done. Um, it just from a line placement perspective, if you watch the cardiology fellows put in a cortis, you know, the interventionalists in the lab are, are incredibly savvy at this, but the actual rank and file cardiology, um, it's, it's not a good scene when a patient needs an emergent pacemaker and they haven't done a cortis in like a long, long time. So uh, we should be doing this. Uh, the, the equipment we had here was not great. Uh, we've uh, made strides to get the right equipment for the job. Um, the cortices we were using didn't actually lock the pacemakers, uh, and so the pacemaker, even if you placed it perfectly, would rip out uh, at a moment's notice. Um, so in T2 and T3, there's a pacemaker draw, and what you'll find in there is the uh, pacemaker box case, as well as these uh, all-in-one kits uh, that have pretty much everything else soft supply you should need, and that's, that's what this is, uh, the, the packaging. It just looks like that, uh, white, it says transvenous pacemaker on it. Um, and you, you need the ultrasound, and you should grab one of those sterile central line bundles as well. And that, that in combo will have everything you possibly need. Um, when you first open this bad boy up, um, there's basically two sections. There's the section with the uh, pacemaker equipment, and then the section for the cordis placement, with the exception that there's the one thing you really need for the pacemaker section, just from a room perspective, these people stuck it, uh, where'd they stick it? Where is the sheath? Here it is. Um, this should have been in the pacemaker kit. This is the sheath that'll actually go over it. So take that and put it aside. You're not gonna use it until you're actually placing the line. Now, you guys all know how to do cortices. If anyone wants a refresher on that, I'm happy to give it at another time. But the only thing that's peculiar to this particular set is the capping is different than you'll see on the, um, the nine French or 8.5 French cortices we use for uh, large volume access. Uh, there's this green cap right here. If you unscrew that, there's springs and other equipment that will spring out and you'll never be able to recover. And you might as well just throw out the kit um, and grab a new one. So don't unscrew entirely that green thing. I mean, if you went too far, like I am too far now, if I let go of tension, it would pop off. You're, you're fine, just make sure you screw it back on if for whatever reason you forgot lefty loosey, righty tighty, but just don't take it off entirely. Um, it's gonna be what clamps down on the actual pacemaker, so it's really important that maintain its uh, integrity. So, you know, just like any other cortis, you're gonna inflate, push this through the uh, permeable membrane and then the nice thing about this, in contradistinction to the cortices we use for large volume access, is it locks. That's, that's a failing of the engineering of the regular cortices, is as you're trying to push them in, the dilator pops out the back. This, by lure lock, locks in. So you just are always gonna lock green to green, and then when you separate, you separate green from green. And if you remember that, you'll do great, all right? So it's just screwing the green into the green, and then uh, when you're ready to separate, you un screws the greens from each other. And then they have a cap on there which serves no purpose and should be taken off. And now it's ready to actually place. And then for, let's see, can you see that? That's a properly assembled one. You have taken that cap off the back, you know, that was here, and now you're good to go because that'll allow the wire to pass through. And so then the, the placement is um, just like you're familiar with, needle, wire, nick, place this in as one unit. Uh, once it's in, you could uh, hold the wire and the internal dilator and take them out together. If you're not dexterous enough for that, just pull out the wire and then take out the internal dilator. But there you know, is a moment then where they're exposed to air and the air embolism risk is potential. So it's always nicer for all these kind of procedures to grab the wire in your pinky and grip the dilator and take them all out as one unit. Um, so in terms of sight, right IJ is the most preferable one because uh, it's a straight shot right to the heart. And then after that, left subclavian is your next best shot. Um, the only slight issue with the left subclavian is that's where they're going to put the pacemaker. And so um, now they have to either leave the patient unbridged for a second, you know, while they're doing, well, not a second, for a few minutes while they're doing the transition, or they have to place a second pace, temporary pacer wire for the ones who are, you know, just can't survive without the pacemaker. So right IJ is, is the real preferable site. The others will work right subclavian and left IJ, but they're more, it's a, uh, the route is harder to get there. All right. 
Any questions about the cord displacement? Now, if you have a patient who really needs this, I, depending on which resident you're gonna be doing this with, I will generally just put the cordis in or let one of the fellows put the cordis in because uh, you know, they still get the, the boon of doing the actual pacemaker, but they could take sometimes 25 minutes to get a cordis in and that's time that a, a patient who really needs it, 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 they don't have. Now, on the other hand, you get a relatively stable patient, um, then by all means, you know, take them through the line in the pacemaker. But when they really need to get it, I, I will usually just put in the cordis and, and say, I'll do the cordis, you do the pacemaker. Um, I don't usually myself bother to suture it in at this point. I'll float the pacemaker and then do all the suturing and dressing later on. This, this won't go anywhere, you know, unless you're pulling at a level that I don't understand. So you don't have to worry. You can just let this sit. The friction is generally enough. I mean, don't be crazy and just, you know, yank with two hands on the pacemaker wire, but in, in general, you don't have to suture it in now. So you could actually do this fairly quickly. Um, but now let's pretend we have a cortis in situ. We've separated the green from green, and that's just sitting there in the patient. Um, you know, pull back on here with the flushes in the central line kit, make sure you get blood return flush, and then you could just lock this. It doesn't need to be on a, a bag of saline or something like that. You could just flush it and leave it for the procedure. All right. now, now you're going to start doing the rest of your prep. and So you're going to open up your pacemaker bag. Now, this syringe is special. It looks like just a 3cc syringe, but it actually is locked so that the most that could go in is 1.5 cc's. If for whatever reason this uh, got lost, then you could just use a 3cc syringe, but just make sure you're not inflating the balloon with more than one and a half um, cc's of air because you can't easily rupture those balloons, all right? So that's all that's special about this syringe. So in general, the first thing I'll do is I'll take that one and a half cc's of air and I'll just test my balloon. And it's not... Like some other types of balloons, um, the, you put in a little and it inflates a little. It's generally an all or nothing phenomenon. Just the tension characteristics of that the balloon is either it's inflated or deflated. There's no partial inflation. So you can see for most of my pushing, nothing happens. And then at some moment it pops into being, which is uh, uh, engineered uh, into it. That's what they want is either it's inflated or deflated. Um, try to inflate slowly. You can rupture. They're, they're not, especially if you're doing like a 30 shot, you know, in and out, in and out. You can rupture these. So just in general, it's worth it to be a little um, slow with your inflation and, uh, and then never actively deflate like you would like when you're pulling out, you know, the, the saline from a Foley, you actually have to pull back. Don't do that. Let it passively deflate. Um, trying to pull the air out um, is an easy uh, source of rupture. All right. So the balloon on this is great. And now there's these, uh, two black leads. One is the uh, distal negative lead that's at the tip of the pacemaker, and the other one's a little bit further back to give a bipolar uh, electrical current conduction. So the only one that's marked is the distal. So you're not, you're going to be looking, oh, you know, this one doesn't say anything. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I think it's stupid on the company's part, but that's intentional. That's not a mistake. The positive says nothing. The negative distal actually says negative distal on it. I don't know if you can read it, but trust me, it says negative and distal. Um, you're going to grab these uh, little lead extenders and put them all the way in. They should seat, you know, all the way down into the black. And you just do that on both of those. What we're going to discuss today is the um, blind float or, you know, maybe augmented with ultrasound, but we're not going to discuss the more elegant, but uh, more difficult EKG float uh, where you're not putting any energy into the pacemaker wire. You're just looking at, uh, you use the tip of the pacemaker as your e e internal EKG lead, and you can actually see by the perturbations of the EKG changes um, where you are. And it's, it's super cool, but it takes a while, and if you're not savvy to it, it's going to be messed up. The blind float is much more applicable to the circumstances we do, which means we're going to actually not, it's blind from the perspective if you're not seeing it on the EKG. That's what that means by blind. But, I mean, you might be seeing it on ultrasound, and that's kind of cool, and we'll talk about that in a second. But... Um, you're actually going to be knowing you're in the right place by applying energy, high energy, to the pacemaker itself. And then that tells you by uh, actually capturing the patient electrically and mechanically that you're in the right place. So that's what we're going to discuss today is this. You're putting a lot of uh, relatively uh, amperage down 
the pacemaker wire and then floating and hoping that the changes on EKG and then on mechanical capture will tell you you're in the right place. Um, because if you're going to use an EKG float, you have to do a whole different setup with attaching, the, figuring out a way to attach these leads to a 12 lead EKG, which is, is a, a set of annoyances in its own um, right. So we have on the leads uh, extenders, we have tested our balloon. Next, we're going to put on this sheath. Now, forgetting this is really embarrassing and sad. First of all, it becomes a nidus for infection, but then they can't reposition the pacemaker either. So you really want to have this here. Um, it's really difficult to forget in this new kit uh, because it's there, but when the old kits, um, it was a separate item that had to be grabbed, and therefore it's very easy to forget it. So don't do that. Um, you're just going to bring that all the way back to the back of the pacemaker setup. Now, how do you know which side goes on? Well, this side actually has a lure sticking out that could, you know, if you look at the cordis, it makes sense that those two can attach. Um, so that's how you know. Um, and then the other side, this blue side, is just a lock. There's nothing that could attach to the cordis. So uh, you want the side that's going to inevitably wind up distal attached to it. Um, yeah, that would have yeah, that would have made sense absolutely from an ergonomics perspective. All right, so this this is all set up from the stuff you could do inside this kit. Then for the rest of it, you got to get your pacemaker box. And these are new ones. I don't know if, if you guys have placed pacers um, since uh, we got these new ones. They're more complicated. This is what we use for post-cardiac surgery patients. Um, they're, not, they're not like the pure idiot mode, you know, one chamber, um, no special functions. This is like, this is the same one they're using in cardiothoracic. The idiot mode ones are gone, and these are better devices too. Um, uh, so you should just learn how to use this. And, and I'll show you in a second. The idiot mode's still here. This is idiot usable. Um, so there is no reason to keep the old ones, but the old ones aren't sold by Medtronic anymore because this makes them a lot more money than the idiot ones. What's that? Yeah. Um, but like I say, this is, could be just as easily used by someone who doesn't know something. I'll show you how to use that in a sec. Um, so if you ever forget, like, oh, what are those modes? What does V mean? I, there, there's an idiot button, and then it's just as, the same as the other one. So you need the box. Um, there should be extra batteries in the box. And then there's multiple forms that you may get these leads in. Um, most common right now that we're trying to change it is these reusable uh, wire extenders. Um, and they'll come in one of two forms. They'll either come in central sterile packaging, which is really nice. It means they've been sterilized. Uh, or they'll come like this, just sitting in the box. And the reason it's nice to have sterile ones is because then uh, you could do all of the um, pacemaker manipulation with the balloon yourself and just hand off the end of the wire to the non-sterile people. And that just takes uh, some people that could screw you over out of the picture. If, they're, um, if it's a non-sterile one like this, you're obliged to hand them the back of the pacemaker uh, wire as opposed to handing them just the end of this wire and then they're now going to be the ones who have to inflate the balloon and uh, I just like you know as a control freak as an obsessive compulsive intensivist I like to own as much stuff as possible what we should be going to is um, they make disposable ones of these that you throw out or just leave with the patient and don't worry about it that are full sterile as well and that's what we'll be getting soon so that'll be the best of all worlds um, so let's pretend this came out of a sterile package just for the sake of what we're doing right now. So what you'd do is you'd hand the end of this off to your non-sterile person, and then they would run the box. And now on the box itself, there's, let's see, yep, that looks right. OK, there's a, an A and the V. I mean, you already could intuit the A is for the atria and V is for the ventricle. We're never going to be atrial pacing in the emergency department. So you just ignore that A hole and go right for the V hole. <laughs> All right, so there you go. So now we're in the ventricular. All right. <laughs> so then you're going to plug it in. If it's sterile, you can plug it in yourself. Otherwise, you have to hand it off to them. And again, hope that they do the right thing. I mean, you could check their work looking over, but you can't touch it if you're the person who's the operator. And so on here, it says positive and negative, right? You guys all see that? Yeah, so you're just going to put the, the one that's marked distal negative into the negative. Make sure you get that right or else this whole thing's not going to work. And then clamp down really tight. You're clamping on metal, so you're not going to over clamp. Um, but it pulling out is a really bad thing if the patient had a, um, 
is having pauses and then they lose their pacemaker. So clamp down hard and then check, right? So now the point of failure is gonna be this uh, interaction between the black and these extender leads as opposed to this thing. And that's how you want it to be because these are in there nice and tight. Um, okay, so now you're hooked up. And now since we're doing a blind float, what they have to do is turn on, which is the on switch up top. It's starting up. All right, and it's gonna ask you what mode you want down here. You guys all see that? Yeah, doesn't that showing? Okay, great, so it has all these modes. It's starting on uh, DDD. Uh, you wanna promptly ignore that. You're gonna use these arrow keys to go to VVI. That's, that's the mode you wanna float in. All right, so I went down there just by using the arrow keys and then I hit enter and now it's in VVI. All right, let's say you don't remember those classifications, you can't handle it, oh my God, I'm gonna kill this patient. Just hit this red button up top, which says DOO, which means it's gonna do dual chamber pacing and it's gonna ignore everything about the patient. And when you press that, it goes to 25 on the milliamps and it goes to 80 on the rate and that will be just fine for anything you wanna do for an emergency pacemaker float. Um, it has atrial output here, but you don't have anything hooked up to it. So you could just ignore that entirely. So if you ever have any doubt, you know, you haven't played with it a while, you've forgotten, just press the red button on top and you'll be good to go. All right, any questions about that? All right, so, but let's go back to the VVI mode we want here. And now be aware, it likes to lock if like a minute has gone by uh, without you doing anything on it. So if you're ever in a situation, you keep pressing buttons and it's not working, it's locked. And there's a lock button right there that will let you again manipulate. So I'm gonna go back to VVI. And now it's gonna default to 80 and 25. 25 is over excessive, you don't need that. So I will do a blind float at 20 and We'll talk about what rate you want in a second, all right? But I'm just gonna put it on 20, and that, that's gonna be the setting. Now, at this point, to figure out what kind of rate we need, we have to talk about a couple scenarios. The scenario one is a patient, they have a third degree heart block, their intrinsic rate is like 38, but their blood pressure's okay. And I, I, I say okay because, um, if their blood pressure is just fine, like the patient looks like a million bucks, generally they don't need a pacemaker. You could send that patient to the CACU, um, at least in this institution. At, at Elmhurst, we would have paced that patient. They would die upstairs. Here, um, they're willing to take those patients. They want to do it themselves. They want to bill for the procedure. I fight them sometimes, sometimes I don't. If the patient looks like a million bucks, they've been stable, you could send them up. But let's pretend you had a patient and their blood pressure is 100 over 60. They're not in a form linear edema. They're doing okay. Uh, but you feel the need that they do need a pacemaker now. In those patients, they don't need transcutaneous pacing while you're putting in the pacemaker. That makes your life easier. So if their rate is like 38, you could put your pacemaker on a rate of 80, and that's fine. Generally, you, you need enough separation between your transvenous rate and the rate the patient's at that you'll see the difference, right? If they're at 50 and you put this at 60, it's gonna be really tough to tell whether the pacemaker's capturing or not, electrically or mechanically. Now, in a second, we'll talk about what to do in the other scenarios where you have to actually have a transcutaneous pacer already on them. Um, that makes it tougher. But for now, we'll just put it at 80, 20, and we could start up the procedure. Now, what you're gonna do, or more likely in our scenarios, the residents are gonna do is you're gonna let them feel like they're doing something by putting the pacemaker wire. The only person who's not actually doing anything during this procedure is the person putting in the pacemaker wire. So it's a wonderful thing because they feel important and you're doing all the work. So that's, that's the best of all worlds. Um, this wire has a curve that comes from the packaging, which the manufacturers will try to tell you is a built-in feature. Um, in the, when you first start your placement, you want that curve to be facing the patient's midline such that uh, when you get into the right atrium, you will curve around into the right ventricle, all right? If you're having a lot of trouble, generally we'll turn 180 degrees and see if it works out with the curve the other way. If you're doing a left subclavian, you want the curve such that it makes a circle like this. Does that make sense? So you want the curve to go 
like that. So then we would orient the curve of the pacemaker like that. Um, if you forget about this, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's all garbage. Um, OK, so now on the wire, there's markings. And as is all interventional procedures, the markings are as stupid as humanly possible. Um, so there's no markings for 10, inexplicably. Uh, there's two bars, that's 20 centimeters, three bars for 30, four bars for 40, and then a fat bar and another normal size bar for 50. Uh, actually, that, I'm lying, that's 60, right? That, yeah, of course, that makes more sense. Fat bar is 50, I just missed 50, which is why I misspoke. There's your 50, right? So it was four bars, small, 40, one big fat bar, it's 50, and then a big fat bar and a little bar is 60. Uh, if you're going to 60, you've missed the boat, all right? You're floating a swan, so. Yep. Yeah, or, or numbers, you know, these things we have that actually <laughs> would, would tell you what you need. So now, the reason it's a little annoying is you want to initially, without the balloon inflated, go into 15, um, which means you have to estimate what five centimeters away from the 20 is because you have no 10 mark. But 15 will just stick the balloon out of the tip of the, uh, of the cortis. If you try to inflate at 10, which is what the, the, uh, the cortis is, it's a 10 centimeter cortis, uh, you're not gonna have much effect trying to blow up that balloon, you just burst the balloon. So, and if you went to 20, it's not a big deal, but in some patients, you might already be in the right atrium at 20. So the ideal is like 15, but honestly, if you forget, just put 20 at the end of the green and you'll, you'll be in pretty good shape. You can see not much is protruding at 20. So between 15 and 20. And then you want to have either yourself, if you are doing, you know, if you had the sterile extension or your friend, you, you would say balloon up, all right? And, and it's worth saying, even if you're doing it yourself, because it reminds people in the room um, to remind you <laughs> that the balloon's up when you go to pull back. So I, you say balloon up, you just get in a habit of that balloon up, and then they put the balloon up and, the, and they should, complete the loop and say, the balloon is up. This is the stupid way it's actually done. Um, okay, so now you have a balloon sticking out and you have your pacemaker. Um, some people will think the balloon provides protection from going through chambers, N maybe a little, but not so much. It's really just a float. So if you have a patient in asystole, there's no reason to put the balloon up because you ain't floating. Um, I mean, we do anyway, but it's not gonna do anything. And then the move is, well, there's, there's I'll tell you the, the way that we usually do it, and I'll tell you like a little uh, elegance point you could try, um, is you're trying to move with some degree of steadiness and speed, and yet not too fast that you're not overriding seeing changes. Um, and this, you know, when we floated swans, if you float super slow, like you go a millimeter at a time, uh, it never really gets that sail effect of being carried by the blood flow. It just kind of meander is about. I don't know. This all could all be bullshit, but this is what we tell everyone when we're training them. So, you know, you just want a nice steady mo motion. And generally, um, at around 20, you're in the right atrium. And then you should really hit ventricle by about 35, sometimes 40. So if you're past that, then you really want to pull back and start again. And when you pull back, you deflate the balloon in an idealized world. You come back to the 20, and then you go forward again. Honestly, when I've had frustrating pacemaker placements where it's just in, out, in, and out, I just stop deflating, and I just will pull back to 20, try again, twist, pull back to 20, try again. Um, that's off book, so if you kill someone or destroy their ventricle and go into the, you know, puncture the free wall and call a pericardial tamponade because you didn't deflate the balloon, I'm not taking credit for that. That's all on you. If the official party line is supposed to deflate every time you pull back and reinflate before you go forward, do as you will. Um, so, you know, you're going, you're going, you're going, and you, you're hitting 30, and now all of a sudden, um, the EKG up on the monitor, um, you know, starts getting that horrible, you can't see anything because it actually looks like they're pacing, right? You know, huge left bundle branch block with a pacemaker spike. Um, uh, that, that's probably electrical capture. That's, that's what we have to go on for electrical capture. Um, but that's not, you haven't won the game yet, right? So the next thing you need to do is see if you have mechanical capture. Now, there's three ways to essentially do that. Uh, two of them are easy and one's annoying. Um, oh, we're doing good on time, I think. What time did you uh, end, Eric? And one okay, great. So um, the best way is they are 
have a good mental status. They're not encephalopathic from malperfusion from their uh, bradycardia. And so they're staying still. They're letting you do what you need to do. So their pulse ox is readable. All right. And the pulse ox is a fantastic sign of mechanical capture because you can't have actual pulse ox without the electrical being translated to forward flow. So you look at the pulse ox, not the, the uh, pulse ox oxygen saturation, but the, the number, you know, it gives you a pulse rate next to the waveform and the waveform itself. So you should see in an ideal world, the patients sit, sit in there comfortably that they go from a pulse ox of 30 waveforms and it says the number 30 next to it to 80, right? That's mechanical capture. Now, sometimes the patient's too unstable, uh, they can't sit still, an A-line is a fantastic sign of mechanical capture because you'll see the A-line tracing go and the number next to it go from 30 to 80. Um, if you don't want to place an A-line but you can't use the pulse ox, then ultrasound, either uh, ultrasound sub looking at the heart and seeing it beating 30 times a minute, now beating 80, or you can put it on the carotid or femoral and either use your you know, mental um, time estimation or you could even put it on M mode and calculate it out, but I don't do that. You just look at it. You know the difference between 30 and 80 when you're looking at it. Um, and you could actually match to the uh, whatever you have, whether it be pulse ox or what have you on the screen to, to see. Um, but you need some form of mechanical capture. Yeah, pulsing, I, I don't buy it. It's garb I feel it at 30. Yeah, fine. Uh, okay. Well, there's a few things, and I've already alluded to one reason. If I can't do it myself, I don't trust it. Um, and uh, But Pulses are notoriously bad, but yes, it, it, it is an acceptable range if you're in a place that doesn't have, you know, an uh, ultrasound machine. Um, now, you're not done. You, you, haven't, you haven't won the game yet, because if you're getting electrical and mechanical capture at 20, that doesn't mean you've, you've really accomplished anything, because 20 could be pacing the atria. You know, if the patient doesn't have a complete AV block, if they're just a pause, or it could be pacing a very uh, unstable portion of the ventricle. So now the next thing you're going to do once you get mechanical capture at the rate you want consistently is you're going to start dialing down your output. All right. So I'm at 20 now. I'm going to go to 15 and it's locked. So I unlock. All right. Now I'm at 15. Great. Are they still capturing electrically and mechanically? They are, okay. So I'll go down to 10. Oh, I lost capture. They go back to 30, so what do you do? You gotta advance. It meant you were in a part of the wall that wasn't really the seated portion you want. You were getting away with it because the energy was so high. So you slowly advance more and it should recapture. Okay, well it recaptures at 10. Now I'll go down to five. Okay, I still have capture, great. I'll go down to three, two, and what you want in an idealized placed pacemaker during initial placement is you really should be able to pace and capture at one milliamp or less. You, you could check it if you wanted to less. It's not worth it. If you hit one and you're still mechanically capturing, great, you've won. You don't leave them at one, you triple whatever it took, your loss of capture. So I lost capture at one, I'll go up to three. Now you could get away with it for a little while if you lose capture at eight, leaving them at 20, but you really don't have a properly placed pacemaker, and that's going to dislodge, and then they're going to be hosed. So you really want to get them around that one milliamp mark and then put them back up to three. But you're not done yet, because now what you want to do is deflate the balloon. Now, usually you don't lose capture at that point. They're still good to go. Uh, sometimes the balloon um, had just pushed them against the wall, and when you deflate it, it moves. In almost every case, if you advance a couple millimeters, you'll get your capture back, all right? The balloon doesn't have that much variance. Now you're still not done. What you want to do now is have the patient cough, right? Because that's going to, if it's you know, tenuously placed, dislodge it. And now you know, OK, well, that could have happened up on the floor, and they would have died. So if they cough, it's still stayed. You've won the game, all right? Now your next step. Basically lodged in the muscle, between the muscle fascicles? Yeah, it should be a little bit like the little trabecular network. It should be in there. So it shouldn't move when they cough. Um, now this green is what locks it down. This is the most important thing. You want to tighten this enough to really feel firm, but not so much that you crack the plastic, you know? So don't be ape-handed about this. Um, but you could crank it pretty well. And now the pacemaker, you know, requires a lot more tension to move. It's still gonna pull out if you really yank it, but it will stay, hopefully. So you crank that, and now the next thing is the actual sheath, you're still sterile at this point, 
You bring it all the way down without dislodging the pacemaker wire at all, and it just clamps on, all right? That doesn't need to be as tight. That's just holding a, a sheath in place. So you just crank that down. Now, everything down here, it's all a unit. They can't move without the others moving, which is great. Now, you'll extend this as high as it'll go. And, you know, depending on how much pacemaker wire you, you have, there might be 10 centimeters still out. That's fine. Just go as far as you can and then crank that down. And now this gives them a lot of sterile pacemaker to play with it and, you know, refloat, go a little deeper if they need to, all right? Then you can suture down your cordis. Now, you're still not done, but this is all bonus points now. So there's the idea of threshold. How many of you have ever adjusted the threshold on one of these? Okay. So if you never touch it, it would be fine. But the idea is you don't want them sensing T waves as QRS, because then they'll see on a patient who's 40 that they're going 80 and this machine won't pace. Does that make sense? Right, because they're seeing double. So what you want in an ideal world is the threshold to see the QRS up here, but to block all the T waves down here. So for a patient who had an uh, EKG like this, you'd want to put the threshold right in the between the two. Now, most of us, um, the, the baseline setting is two um, millivolts. That's usually fine for most patients, but if you See, they're not getting paced mechanically, even though they're still going 40 when you look at the EKG, then you have to touch the threshold. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna come down here and it's gonna tell you locked again. Uh, so you unlock and it's, you see the threshold, the sensitivity right now is set to, uh, oh, it's flipped, okay. Two millivolts, right? Does, does that come through? Okay, so I'm gonna adjust that. Now here's the idea. The, um, the way to think about this threshold is you're building, I didn't come up with this. This is a brilliant way to teach it. It's one of the Australians. It's you're building a wall that the pacemaker could either see over or it can't, right? Well, you're building a wall to prevent it from seeing at whatever level you build the wall at, right? So if you put it to zero, it sees everything. There's no wall in its way. What you want is to build the wall higher than the T wave. So. Exactly. So you're trying to build a wall so that, yeah, <laughs> horrible. Um, so you're trying to build a wall higher than T-waves. So this is counterintuitive because it means the higher the wall, the less sensitive, right? So the numbers go opposite how you think. Because if I build a higher wall, it is a less sensitive pacemaker, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So that, that was like the good like, uh, way of thinking about it because otherwise it doesn't, it's counterintuitive because it should be the higher you go in a number, the more sensitive. But you're actually building a, a barrier between the pacemaker seeing. So if at two, it's still double sensing because the T waves are big, then go to three and see. Go to four and see if you could block the pacemaker's ability to see those T waves. Now, if you have a T and QRS that are the same, you might not win this one and you might have to go to an asynchronous mode. All right. Questions about that stuff so far? Can you just look at the largest T wave on the EKG? You could. They, the measurements are congruous, yeah. Um, but, but that's the idea. But, so if it's sense, if on a VVI, if it senses the QRS and T wave, it won't give any pacing at all if it was 40 and you set it to 80. So you'd know because there are no mechanical captures at 80. You have the uh, amp up so high that it went through anyway. Well, no, because the, the inhibition happens regardless of the amperage. So the inhibition happens before it delivers a pacemaker spike. Um, okay, so just in the interest of time, the other stuff, since it's basically the same, we could go through pretty quickly. What do you do when you have a patient? What's that? We're done with that first scenario. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, there's a lot, but it, it, it flows to it once you do it a few times. Um, yeah, and you, you know, you spike the football, all that. So... Um, what about the patient who's complete heart block going 28 and their blood pressure is 40 over 20? Well, you, you got to pace them transcutaneously, right? You got no choice. For that transcutaneous pacing, it's even more important to make sure you have mechanical capture because um, the, there's no way to tell by electricity. 
And we often have, and we have numerous M&Ms of patients, you thought you had transcutaneous capture because the rate came up to 80 and they were still dying because their mechanical capture wasn't there. So it's even more important to look at that pulse ox on the transcutaneous. Once you have mechanical capture on the transcutaneous, what you want to do is lower it to a, as low as you get away with to still support the patient's blood pressure well, and usually that's between 50 and 60. So put the transcutaneous, whatever it is, the patient has a good blood pressure, they're not dying anymore. Then you have to double the rate of your pacemaker. So you can really see a discrepancy between their transcutaneous pacing and your transvenous pacing. Because then you'll know they jump from 50 to 100 or 60 to 120, and you, you really could see it. Now, the annoying thing is you know what the EKGs look like when they get it transcutaneously paced, right? That you can't tell anything. So you lose your ability to know when you have electrical capture, which is annoying. So you have to either purely look at your mechanical capture. You can only look at your pulse ox wave, you know, and number dumping from 50 to 60. Or the cool thing is um, you could actually look at the sensing light. So right now you're only going to see a pacing light or actually an occasional sensing light. It's blue. The pacing light is green. The sensing light is blue. What you could do is leave your energy at zero and just insert until you start seeing the sensing light, the blue is there. And what that means is you're in the atrium because that's the first time it's going to be starting to sense or you might be in the ventricle. And then you know, okay, it should only be at most another 10 centimeters of going in. Does that make sense? You seem, you seem not to get it. If you're in this SVC, it won't sense. So if you just gently insert until the blue sensing light starts going off, that tells you you're now in either the low atrium or the ventricle. So, but if you forget about it, don't worry. You just float empirically around the 30 to 40 mark is when you expect to hit it, and then you just look at your waveform on your pulse ox or your arterial line. All right. Um, let's see. Is there anything else I could tell you? Oh, the most important thing. <laughs> this box has to be replaced in real time. When you tell the nurse, when the nurse is going up, they're not going to remember unless they're like super good. Um, you have to remind them when the patient's ready to go upstairs, I need you to take a box from CCU and bring it back. Because what happens is, um, in general, since now we all use the same boxes, like this one, let's see, is this ours or is this, a lot of these, you'll see it actually says CCU on the back. We're fine taking their box. We don't have ownership stakes in this. The hospital's all using the same ones in all the units. So ask them for one of their spares and bring it back. We always want to have two, one in T3, one in T2 at all times. So you can't just send the patient up and forget about it because then it's not until Candace and I come in on Monday and realize we have no pacemaker boxes. And then that, if there were a patient came during that time, it would be a shit show. So um, you got to remember and have the residents remember to get the pacemaker box back from CCU. All right, questions? <laughs>